the dinner party. There are still some rich people in the world who lead dull, boring, and frustrated lives, compelled to listen to chamber music every other night, to sit through interminable operas which they do not understand. But rich people do have their problems. There are seldom problems of finance, since most rich people usually hire other people to take care of their worries. But there are other problems. They are problems of behavior. Let me tell you one such a problem, which beset my uncle Octavian a full 30 years ago. My uncle Octavian was a charming and accomplished host whose villa on the Côte d'Azur was an accepted rendezvous of the great. He was a hospitable, contented and most amiable man until January the 3rd, 1925. There was nothing special about that day in the life of my uncle Octavian except that it was his 55th birthday. As usual, on such a day, he was giving a dinner party, a party for 12 people. All of them were old friends. Two of them were, uh, indeed, what we call old flames. <laughs> I myself, aged 15, was deeply privileged. I was staying with my uncle at his exquisite villa near Cap d'Antibes, and on this happy day, I was allowed to come down to dinner. Towards the end of a wonderful dinner, when dessert had been brought in, the servants had left, my uncle leaned forward to admire a magnificent diamond ring on the prince's hand. She was a beautiful, very attractive woman. She turned her hand gracefully towards my uncle, Across uh, the table, the newspaper proprietor leaned on the table and said, Oh, may I also have a look, Therese? She smiled and nodded. Then she took off her ring and held it out to him. It was my grandmother's, the old empress, she said. It is said to have once belonged to Genghis Khan. There were exclamations of delight and admiration. The ring was passed from hand to hand. For a moment it rested on my palm, gleaming splendidly. Then I passed it on to my next door neighbor. As I turned away again, I thought I saw her pass it on. It was some 20 minutes later when the princess stood up. She looked around us with a pleasant smile and then she said, Oh, before we leave, you may have my ring back. I remember my uncle Octavian saying, Oh, yes, that's wonderful ring. Then there was a pause, while each of us looked expectantly at his neighbor. Then there was silence. The princess was still smiling, though less easily. She was unused to asking for things twice. If you please, she said with a touch of utter, then we can leave the gentleman to the port. When no one answered her, the silence continued. I still thought that it could be only a practical joke and that one of us would produce the ring with a laugh. But when nothing happened at all, I knew that the rest of the night would be dreadful. There was the freezing politeness of the prince, the near tears of the princes, there was the demands to be searched, the overturning of chairs, the minute scrutiny of the carpet, but nothing brought the prince's ring back again. No servants had entered the room. No one left it for a moment. The thief was one of us one of my uncle Octavian's cherished friends. 
Uncle Octavian's face was pale and tremendously tense, as if he had been dealt a mortal blow. There will be no searching, he said. Not in my house. You are all my friends. The ring can only be lost. He bowed towards the princess. I will naturally make amends myself. A few days later, I went back to England. I was glad to escape. The sight of my uncle's face and the knowledge of his overturned world were more than I could bear. I know that he never returned to his lonely house near Cap d'Antibes and that he remained recluse for the rest of his days. I know that to our family's surprise, he was a comparatively poor man when he died. He died with a special sadness of a hospitable host who never gave a single lunch or dinner party for the last 30 years of his life. Well, that's a very, very sad story. <laughs>